Shall we wait? Uh... Shall we wait another minute and before we start? Yeah, okay. I think we should start now, Marco, what do you say? Yeah, since we have two speakers. Okay, good, wonderful. I see there are still people joining us. But, so let's start with the introduction. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our open science seminar, uh, jointly organized by ICTP's SDI unit and the Marie Curie Library. We're very happy to have you here. And we'll again have a very interesting uh, topic today. We're going to talk about uh, the pitfalls of open science and propose possible solutions uh, for that. So today we're going to have um, two speakers. Um, the first speaker is uh, Dr. Tony Ross Heller. He is the leader of the Open and Reproducible Research Group at Graz University of Technology and the No Center in Graz, Austria. He has a background in information science and philosophy and his research focuses on a range of issues related to open science evaluation, skills, policy, governance, monitoring and infrastructure. So welcome, uh, Tony. We're looking forward to your uh, presentation. And uh, the, our second uh, speaker is Professor Jean-Sébastien Coe. He's professor of low dimensional quantum condensed matter at the University of Amsterdam. He is uh, a strong believer in openness in scientific publishing and is devoted to building new infrastructure to facilitate this. Um, he's also the founder, chairman and lead developer of SciPost. We're very happy to have you here. I hope, uh, Jean-Sébastien, I hope that I uh, pronounced the name correctly, so forgive me if I didn't. And very, well. we were... very, good. Okay. very good, thank you. And uh, you're going to talk about SciPost. So we're very much looking forward to your, um, to your presentations, to your talks. And um, we'll have a question and answer session afterwards. Uh, so for everybody, uh, if you have questions, please feel free to post them already in the chat and we'll come back to that. Okay, I think, uh, I hope I haven't forgotten anything. So Marco, is there anything that you want to add? So wonderful. Okay, so then uh, let's start with Tony. Tony, the floor is yours. Can you see my slides? You should be full screen in a second, hopefully. Wonderful, we can see them, but not yet full screen. Yes, now yep. it is. Yes, perfect, thank you. Okay, so um, firstly, um, Ava and Marco um, and ICTP, thank you so much for the uh, kind invitation to speak to you today. Um, I saw from the list of speakers that you've had and that will have, uh, this looks like a fantastic series um, of events. And obviously, sorry that I can't be with you there in Trieste, beautiful Trieste. Um, can I just double check? Um, can you see my full screen or, or is that part of it grayed out, no? Okay. Yes, it works, fine. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so um, today uh, I will talk to you mainly about um, a project which we just uh, recently completed called On Merit. Um, which ran from October 2019 to March 2022. Um, it was funded under the European Commission Science and With and For Society program, and we used sociological, um, bibliometrical, and computational approaches to study the way that open science impacts on equity, and especially the way that um, maybe some unintended consequences it has, negative consequences 
um, for the equity within uh, the scientific system. And as I'll explain, I have always seen, I think a lot of others, equity is really a, one of the key aims of open science. There are, there are many, obviously, um, and this is maybe part of the problem that we'll, we can talk about, but I've always seen equity as a very key aim of open science. Um, a few years ago, we noticed that there were some areas where maybe the way open science was being implemented might be um, might be problematic problematic in terms of equity, and this was kind of, this was the the basis um, of our project, which I'll describe to you today. So, um, in a seminar series on open science, I guess I don't need to tell you what open science is, but just to say it's a bunch of different things. So making publications open access is obviously a very different set of practices, very different set of concerns, different set of problems than is making software open source or opening methods, protocols, and materials, or making uh, data either open or at least findable, accessible, um, uh, interoperable and reusable. Um, and so open science is kind of a, a boundary term some people would even include elements of citizen science, which seek to bring down the, the barriers between the, the academy, the, the ivory tower, and wider societal actors. Um, and there's a whole uh, lot of uh, ways that the peer review process can be opened up and the, and the processes of, of researcher and research evaluation can be um, opened. So open science is a bunch of different practices, but it's also a many, many, different principles or, or aims which underlie these, I think. So here is a slide which um, I, I, I still use, it, it's very old now. Um, so in 2015, I think, um, which is really when I um, really joined the open science community and became an advocate for it, I guess. I just put on Twitter, what do you think the principles of open science are? And this is just a list of all, all the different answers that, um, that I got there. So it's um, a lot of different, very good things, obviously, transparency, accountability, inclusivity, responsibility, community collaboration, visibility, rigor, equality, and science for the public good as well. And you see already in there that there are a lot of um, uh, concepts which relate to diversity, equity, inclusion, and so on. And the first thing I want to say is that I've always seen these, um, and maybe this is uh, a point that we could discuss, as key goals of open science. So if we look back to the Budapest Open Access Initiative, which just had its 20th anniversary, in very utopian language, in uh, it, it was this kind of still um, affected quite a lot by the utopianism um, that accompanied the, the early stages of, of the web, we see language that open access, which is, and here meaning making publications open access, um, would uh, share, enable us to share learning between rich and poor and lay the foundation for uniting humanity in a common intellectual conversation and quest for knowledge. Um, uh, Michael Nielsen, um, his really seminal book, uh, uh, Reinventing Discovery, has a whole chapter about democratization and how open science and um, new web-enabled ways of doing science can democratize processes. Um, in a stakeholder study um, recently, increased equity was listed as a key success factor for open science. So a, a key factor by which um, success should be judged for open science. Um, and here's another paper from 2020, which says that um, open science principles of openness and transparency provide opportunities to advance diversity, justice, and sustainability by promoting diverse, just, and sustainable outcomes. So um, equity is a key aim of open science, I argue, or it has been for many, many people at least, but is one aim amongst many others. So increasing transparency in the, in the um, research system. If you ask the funders like the European Commission, you would see the uh, the word efficiency popping up and there very often they mean return on investment for funding um, and so what i want to point out is that many of these principles might be at odds with each other if you want more efficient science 
um, uh, or, or you are trying to fund um, excellence in science specifically, then the distribution of, of resources within the system, um, this might have implication for the distribution of resources. So open science is a, a bunch of different uh, practices and principles. And the definition of open science is being pushed by various groups in uh, various ways. So whose agenda is at play in open science? Is it uh, researchers from lots of different disciplines? So in physics, um, uh, you maybe have a very different idea of what open science is or should be than in social sciences and humanities, but maybe in different parts of the world we'll have very different conceptions as well. I think we definitely do. Um, from the uh, vantage point of research funders, Obviously, as I said, efficiency is of, often comes through as very key. Um, and open science was sold, at least initially, with open data policy and so on, that it would open um, data is the new oil, and kind of research data is this unexploited resource that we can open up and it will fire up the economy and, and so on. All, all these kind of promises were made for what open science was and, and could do. So, from the perspective of research institutions, and we know, of course, from the perspective of the traditional and also the newer uh, publishers, um, the way that the traditional publishers have uh, kind of maybe um, could be accused of co-opting the language of open science, open washing, um, the way they kind of uh, tried to ignore it and then they tried to degrade it and then they've tried to co-opt it in my view. Um, how do all these different agendas for what open science is shape the open science reality that we are constructing? and still are constructing. So open science, open access is um, very well progressed, obviously. Um, opening data and making data shit fair, uh, there's lots and lots um, in, in place already for that, but open science is far from, um, from uh, a done deal. And the next point that I want to make is the uptake of open science is um, not, it, it's not free. So to do open science, you need a lot of infrastructure, uh, which relies on resources. You need a lot of training and support. Um, and so this is in terms of materials, but also in terms of people and capacity within institutions to support people. And, and then you need a lot of uh, political will, either um, leaders of institutions or um, uh, governments of, uh, and, and so on. And access to those advantages, obviously, isn't equally distributed. If we think about what we said about researchers and the, the many different types of agendas that might be at play from people in different disciplines or different regions, and then we think of across those disciplines and across those regions, the access to these kind of resources, obviously, is not equally distributed. Um, so just to say where we're starting, one of the places we're starting from, academia isn't equal. So there are structural inequalities that persist across regions and demographics. Global North research still dominates, um, pushing Global South research to the periphery. Even within the richer regions, the goal of excellence um, has clustered, has tended to further cluster funding towards the already um, uh, well-funded. Uh, women, of course, still occupy relatively fewer higher positions, um, achieve senior positions at later ages. Um, and my, um, uh, I started out in philosophy and so come from the humanities and, and I think it definitely is true that because um, of economic advantages uh, that they bring the, the STEM subjects um, science, technology, engineering, maths are privileged over social sciences and humanities, I think so. So academia itself has structural inequalities. And within science, there is also a mechanism of cumulative advantage, which seems to mean that those who already have are the ones who, who are most rewarded. So. The, sociolog the sociologist uh, Robert Merton uh, in the 60s proposed the Matthew effect in science. Um, this comes from the Gospel of Matthew. For to everyone who has will more be given, 
and he will have abundance, but from him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Um, and so the basic point was here that um, Merton uh, saw was that already successful scientists tend to receive disproportionately high rewards um, in comparison to their counterparts. If you already won that prize in your very early career, you're much more likely uh, to win the, the Nobel Prize. And I, I think a lot of this came from interviews with Nobel scientists. Uh, scientists, but also in terms of grant funding. So there have been studies which show um, if people uh, get one grant, they're more likely to get the next grant and so on. Um, and in fact, this effect of cumulative advantage is a place throughout academia. So journals um, in terms of uh, the, because they have the higher impact factor, they, uh, the, the researchers are um, uh, brimming to get in there. And this kind of um, has its own effect of cumulative advantage at the level of institutions, obviously. The rich institutions we know are a lot more well supported. Um, uh, they um, have a lot more um, possibility to hire. So at the level of institutions, departments, countries, at the level of individual attributes. Um, so in terms of gender, there's a paper called uh, the Matilda effect, which studies effects of, of gender and cumulative advantage. And in terms of race as well, there's a paper about the African Eve effect, um, studying effects on race. And it's also across a range of scientific activities. So in terms of citations, if you're already very highly cited, you will just get more citations just because you're already in name. Um, so academia is an attention economy, we know. Um, and, and so uh, this effect of cumulative advantage is also work in peer review in public engagement and funding acquisition. At the end, I have the bibliography with links to papers which uh, describe these effects. And so um, bringing it all together there, open science isn't a unified ideology, but a diverse bunch of principles and practices. Equity is often stated as a core aim, but just because things are open, it won't necessarily ensure equity. Factors like region, gender, discipline, and access to resources continue to shape the possibilities of participation in an open science world. And perhaps most crucially here, there are various routes to the implementation of what we call open science, and the how is crucially important, um, along with that, the why. So what are the principles, the main things that we are trying to achieve with open science? Um, and so, um, although, um, I'm not talking about the pitfalls of open science per se. I'm talking about the pitfalls of open science done in the wrong way for, uh, for the wrong reasons. So the question that on merit started with was, might open science be at risk in some cases of reinforcing existing privileges or creating new ones? Uh, the first output that we had was a paper uh, published at the start of this year in Royal Society Open Science, which was a review of the literature so we reviewed 268 relevant studies across um, so both scientific and also policy um, uh, work for what dynamics um, of cumulative advantage or structures of inequality that could um, be at work in the transition to open science across disciplines, regions, demographics. And here we found a lot of different concerns. Um, uh, so on the right, I just put um, the, the table just to show you that it was a lot. I don't expect you to read that, but on the left is kind of the, the summation of this. So the, the threats are the costs of participation in open science, um, the fact that there are different political agendas at play. Um, the main point that I'll move on to uh, next, which is about the discriminatory nature of the um, article processing charge business model. Um, cumulative nature of data inequalities, which means that it's not only making data open isn't enough to level the playing field because you still need certain data skills to be able to um, um, take advantage of that open data. The platform logic of open science, which is leading to um, an accumulation of um, uh, an accumulation and a gr um, growing together of services all along the, the research workflow, especially by the traditional publishers. 
and also the kind of surveillance capitalism element where they're able then to extract analytics from these services and then sell them back to us. Um, lack of reward structures is um, the difficulties and logics of participation, exclusion of certain uh, societal voices um, and the resource intensive nature of translational work. Just briefly on that, um, we found that um, we did a lot of work with policymakers to see what impact open access was having. And the, the fact was that it was still marginal because even if the papers are open, a lot of them are, and even their assistants aren't going to read them. They're going to wait until they have a policy brief written in their language, digestible and delivered to them. And writing good policy briefs is also a, um, a resourceful activity. So, Open science improves the practice of research, but not automatically, not without new risks for inequality and other adverse effects. We must not be naive. Um, and these issues all arise as a result of uh, the ambiguity and of open science as a term and the politics behind it. The fact that it is resource intensive and transitioning towards it needs money um, and certain network effects of cumulative advantage um, that are at play. Um, there is uh, an argument that open science kind of ignores other kind of ways of, of knowing, especially from the humanities or the social sciences, so narrow epistemologies. Um, and the, the kind of, there is an argument that there is a logic of neoliberalism. I won't go into that now, but um, definitely um, happy to discuss it afterwards. So within On Merit, we um, sought to look at these questions, especially to look at um, the effects of um, barriers to accessing literature and the effects of open science and responsible research and innovation practices on career progression and in promotion policies and um, uh, the uh, dynamics of cumulative advantage in training. So this is within academia. We also look to industry and the uptake of open science resources, drivers and barriers to that uptake, including through um, a, a scan of the European patent literature. Um, within policy, so this is part of this work to which I referred to, um, uh, we looked at the uptake of open science resources amongst policymakers, the drivers and barriers, um, and reflected on the ways in which open science uh, breaks down barriers to participation in both research as well as participatory policy making. Um, the project is now finished and we have a lot of results, um, which we are in the process of, of preparing for publication, which hasn't gone quite as fast as we thought, but it never does. Um, so on our results page, you'll find all of these studies. Um, one example, and so this is covered especially in, in um, what's their uh, deliverable 3.2, cumulative advantage in open science and RRI, a large scale quantitative study. So in what remains of my time today, I want to discuss this particular question of the ways in which cumulative advantage might be at work in the transition to open access publishing, and especially the effects that the um, model of open access publishing or um, that is based on uh, charging um, authors or their institutions, article processing charges, what effects this might um, um, be having already. Um, and so I should say this, this builds on work which already predated our, our um, project. So um, a paper by uh, Carl Seiler et al um, found, and this was looking at health, their results um, found that Authors affiliated with high ranked universities and well funded institutions tend to have more resources to choose pay options um, with publishing. Um, and their research suggested that new professional hierarchies were developing in publishing with um, different open access publishing options um, prominent for different groups. Um, just as there is stratification in institutional representation, there is also inequality within access types. Um, 
I moved on quite quickly here to talk about the article processing charge model, I think. And um, so just to be clear, not all open access is funded by um, article processing charges, of course. In fact, most open access, fully open access journals don't charge um, article processing charges, but the most high throughput journals usually do. And this means that um, uh, most, um, uh, uh, and so this, along with the fact that a lot of the uh, traditional publishers have now moved to this, ha have this hybrid option where you can either publish in closed access for free or you can pay. Um, this means that there is an increasingly big market for um, articles funded by article processing charges. And these article processing charges are increasing. Um, so at the moment, I think it's between 1500 and 2000, but we've seen um, the bar being raised. So Nature Communications has 5,000, and it seems that there's kind of a normalization um, with various deals that Nature has been doing at the moment that to publish in, 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 the Na in Nature, the main journal, um, it would probably be a fee of about 10,000 um, euros. Um, just for contrast, so I have a project with uh, colleagues in Ukraine. This is, they tell me this is about um, three to four times the monthly salary for a professor there. Um, another paper which recently came out and looking at this effect found um, the same. That, um, and this paper was different in that it looked at the, the mirror journals. So um, when some funders said, you we won't pay hybrid what clever publishers some clever publishers did was they just created a new journal which looked exactly like the other journal and put the the article processing charge um uh, papers in in this uh, other journal called the mirror journal um but this meant that there was a, a a very easy well not easy but a very good comparison between who is publishing in this closed journal and who is publishing in this um open journal it's the same journal so you don't have to worry then about kind of uh, maybe they're um, from different disciplines or maybe um, they have different impact factors or so it's the same journal. And this found that um, those publishing in APC, the, um, the open access, um, they found uh, that this was discriminating against those with limited resources, especially those from less resource regions and institutions. And so, just to lead on to our research, uh, which will hopefully be published soon, um, we found exactly the same. Um, those from more prestigious institutions tended to publish in journals with higher APCs. Um, here, the, the uh, I think I'll move a bit quicker. Um, and that there are stratification effects which seem to be getting worse over time. So in fact, this gap seems to be increasing over time as well. Um, based on this in the final stage of our project, um, and so we didn't only look at this issue, obviously we looked at many others. Um, in the final stage of our project, we worked with funders, research institutions and, and researchers to co-create a set of uh, recommendations, um, which we've now published and you can find it this link here. We identified from our whole project and all the issues that we um, uh, looked at, we identified four priority areas for action. The fact that re, um, uh, open research can be so resource intensive, requires a lot of um, infrastructure and support um, services and people, um, article processing charges and stratification effects, which we just discussed. And uh, we also discussed problems of societal inclusion in research um, and especially in policy relevant research and the need to reform reward and recognition structures because this is really a barrier to, to a lot of um, uptake in open science. So I think I was meant to talk for between 20 and 25 minutes. I think I'm almost there. Um, if I finish then with our recommendations uh, that we co-created, um, so funders, institutions and researchers should collectively demand greater transparency from publishers on publication costs regarding prices and services, and where possible, support open infrastructures to collect that information. The more we know about what publishing costs, the, more, the less we'll feel 
like we're being gouged with these um, uh, what can seem very high costs. Um, funders, institutions and researchers should support alternative publishing models. And we're about to hear about an excellent one where those show potential to be more inclusive, including consortial funding models for open publishing infrastructures, which support open access publishing with no author facing charges. So there are um, various models for what's called diamond op um, open access, which is there's no barrier to readership and there's no barrier to authorship. And um, there is plenty of money in the system, obviously, and we must have a way of um, uh, uh, sustainably distributing that money to sustain um, open publishing services. Um, funders, institutions and researchers should encourage and support the use and maintenance of sustainable shared and open source publishing infrastructure to reduce costs and promote open standards. Institutions and researchers should ensure the accepted version or later of peer reviewed works are always deposited in an open repository. The, what I've discussed the problem with open access obviously is a problem with what's called gold open access, open access publishing. We still have the option to publish uh, or, to, or to deposit our publications in um, in repositories and we should always um, take that and that could be supported by funders and institutions um, supporting authors rights to self archives um, uh, pub, uh, to publications by implementing what are called rights retention strategies, which is where you write in already to your contract with the publisher that you that you retain the right to deposit your um, publication. I will uh, finish there. There were a couple more slides about rewards um, and recognition, but um, I'll share the, the slides um, and that can be distributed to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Tony, for for your presentation, um, and also thank you for already thank you for sharing the slides. Um, I would say we move on to uh, Jean Sebastian with your talk. Okay. I think this fits perfectly well since we've been talking about Diamond Open Access and Cypost, as Tony has already mentioned, is a very good example. So um, the floor is yours. Okay, very good. So uh, uh, thanks a lot for, for having me. I'll try to, uh, to squeeze the talk a bit so we still fit in the, uh, in the time because some of the things that I wanted to say have already been said anyway. Let me introduce you to SciPost. If you haven't seen it uh, before, it's a kind of concretization of many ideas about open science that I wanted to, uh, to implement a few years ago. Um, so what's the plan of what I want to tell you today? I want to take like five minutes to introduce you to SciPost if you're not already familiar with it. I want to give you some examples of implementations of best practices that the initiative tries to, uh, uh, to do. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the machines behind it. You know, I'm a, I, I'm a scientist, I like machines, and for me the whole point of this whole thing is indeed to kind of empower scientists and academics by giving them the tools that they need to, uh, uh, to cover all their publishing needs. I want to underline some of the, dif uh, the difficulties that uh, we've faced and are continuously facing, and maybe you know, also finish with a couple of uh, lessons out of the experiences, and certainly about the, uh, uh, the, the kind of general area of diamond OA that's already been talked about by Tony. Okay, so um, what is uh, SciPost? Uh, <laughs> it's quite simply a complete uh, publishing system. So it takes care of absolutely all the different layers that you might need when you're thinking about scientific publications. Uh, so, you know, from preprints, uh, preprint services, we have our own preprint server, uh, to metadata deposition, curation, and, you know, interlinking. And who runs it? It's very much a grassroots uh, initiative. It's entirely created and, you know, uh, empowered by people within academia. And what does it offer? I mean, in a first iteration, it's really the academic journals that we have on there, although there are additional services to kind of uh, provide additional value on these things. And if I had to summarize it by two key words, it's really uh, uh, about openness and quality. The idea is that you leverage the idea of openness at lots of different levels in order to increase transparency, verifiability, and overall quality. Okay, so that's where it kind of uh, comes from. And what does it aim to achieve? Well, you know, when you've been in academia for long enough at some point, uh, and certainly when you're a scientist anyway, it's your job to think of new things. So we want a complete reform at all levels, <laughs> um, or at least offer some additional things that don't necessarily exist in the uh, current landscape. So we want to implement something which I personally call genuine open access. 
um, which is, if you want, the kind of moral extrapolation of all the values that you might want to, uh, to express within an open model in there. Um, on the other side, we also want to greatly clean up the business model that's associated to publishing because it's indeed, like uh, Tony has already mentioned, it's been kind of co-opted a bit from a corporate side that has very different priorities, very different long-term goals here. Um, so uh, we also want to modernize a little bit the editorial processes. So, you know, it started in physics and essentially the big thing that we added here was the idea of open refereeing to make it essentially possible to have meaningful discussions based on referee reports you know, that could really contain lots of uh, things that other scientists could use. So that's, uh, that's one thing. And in the longer term, we also want to reform the impact assessment, which is something that I'll come back to near the end of the, of the talk. Um, so uh, just a, a couple of comments about the activities. So we have a certain number of journals. I'm just here mentioning those in physics because these are the ones that are really kind of running. Uh, started publishing in late 2016. We've got about 1,200 publications uh, as of now at a tempo of about uh, four or 500 papers currently per year. Um, so the best practices that you can associate to, uh, to SciPost, well, certainly if you're a physicist, you're not used to open refereeing. So we have an editorial process that I'll very briefly sketch on this. I want to spend some time talking about the consortial business model here, because I do think that it's an important direction for institutions and funders to support in the future, uh, even if you're measuring that need purely on pecuniary criteria. Um, I want to emphasize that SciPost is also very much a community-driven thing, so it's really meant to belong and stay in the hands of academia. I want to talk again about the machines, the infrastructure, really emphasize its openness and uh, what it uh, means for its sustainability. Um, so taking a few seconds about the editorial workflow, so what are the most important aspects um, submission is performed as per other journals. Uh, submissions come in, they're checked for lots of things like plagiarism and internal checks. But then things start being different. Um, the people driving our editorial process, uh, processes are so-called fellows of the editorial colleges. Um, uh, benefits of an Oxford education, I guess I've always liked the idea of uh, a college. It's very collegial. And it uh, kind of distinguishes it, uh, distinguishes it a little bit from, you know, say, closed door, single editor, very often not professional academic uh, decision-making in other places. So um, one of the fellows at the college has to express interest in running the uh, refereeing system on the incoming submission. So it is possible to be kind of desk projected if you fail to attract the attention of the fellows. So the fellows swim through the pool of submissions and pick out the ones that they think are really, really worth uh, uh, going through. And the other ones uh, you know, although it's a minority, they'll be desk projected. And then the editorial process starts when such a fellow takes charge of the submission and opens a refereeing round. And the refereeing round consists of invited refereeing invitations you know, sent to members of the community, but it's also possible to um, uh, uh, volunteer reports on submissions undergoing evaluation. You just have to be a registered contributor at SciPost which means that we've checked that you are actually a, a working academic. Uh, and then that empowers you to submit a report on any submission, even if you haven't been explicitly invited to provide a report. That doesn't happen in most circumstances, but it does. It's something that we want to instill a little bit more as a practice as we go along. Um, then very importantly, the uh, publication decisions are not taken by single editors. The uh, editor in charge, uh, 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 their role is limited to formulating a recommendation as to what should happen to the submission. And the editorial college as a whole then takes a vote uh, to determine the further process. So uh, can, the result can be publication, can be rejection, can be return to refereeing, uh, et cetera. So that's a little bit how it goes. So there are lots of different ways to verify things as you go along. There's a lot of openness also in the, in the discussions, the availability of the material built during the evaluation phase. So that's the editorial workflow that's there that we use in all the journals that we have. Now, if I switch to uh, the business model, um, the key word that's uh, been kind of adopted is, uh, is diamond, which I think is really, really unfortunate because again, it's uh, packing lots of different things into one word. I, per I uh, personally much prefer metals and their variety. So um, how does Cypos characterize itself? First of all, there's no question of having any subscription fees or article processing charges. I have a total abhorrence to the idea of the article processing charges. 
Uh, I will discuss that a bit later also. And I think it's becoming more and more manifest to everybody what the pernicious effects are of this APC-based uh, business model. So platinum publisher, as I post, no APCs, no subscriptions, no author-facing charges. Um, uh, all the operations are fully not for profit. So there's no corporate entity in the background that tries to, uh, to skim off a 40% profit margin on the activities of the scientists. This is really entirely open, entirely not for profit based on a, an official legal foundation in the, in the Netherlands. Um, very importantly, although we run a very, very stringent refereeing protocol and also a very stringent production protocol on the papers, we are able to operate at a scale of something much lower than the current habits for APCs. APCs now really average something well above uh, 2,000. It's become the norm by certain journals to have 2,500, even 3,000, 5,000, 10,000, and it's only going up. Uh, so we believe we can bring that down by, say, half an order of magnitude as compared to the current norm. Um, the idea is really a consortial model, which means that institutions worldwide throw money in the pot for us to run the operations. If you're familiar with the archive preprint server, that's essentially what it's based on. Okay, So there's no um, uh, invoicing directly uh, for you know, uh, publishing charges for every single publication out there. We just give agglom agglomerate uh, the data to the institutions to determine the, uh, uh, the level of the support that they can give it to us. And I'll give you an example with the ICTP later on if I get there. Okay, so um, uh, another important aspect is that it's very much community driven. So we have these virtual general meetings with our colleges. The college in physics now has like above 160 fellows uh, 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 active in there uh, from all different time zones. Cypost really views itself as an entirely international initiative, although funnily enough in the Dutch press, they really like to insist that it's a Dutch initiative, but then I like to remind them that I'm actually not Dutch, I'm still French Canadian. So <laughs> it's, it's really an international initiative. Um, uh, it doesn't aim to have geographical localization in any way, although you know uh, having activities throughout the world is really quite a, quite a challenge, but that's what we're going uh, towards. Okay, so um, the, the infrastructure itself um, actually was built from scratch. So when I started uh, looking at uh, implementing this thing, I looked at the available systems and none of them were able to run the editorial processes that I was interested in. So, you know, uh, tough luck. Um, I just uh, taught myself uh, web programming and all these things. I was already using computers on the side to, uh, to do part of my work. So it was kind of a, a pleasant experience to learn all this new technology. All our systems are built from scratch based on existing uh, free and open source uh, uh, software systems. Uh, we like to be a bit on edge of developments as well. So uh, if you know a little bit about that, uh, you can have a very, uh, we can have an interesting discussion about you know, single page applications, JavaScript driven, or this new technology, HTMX, which I'm now trying to champion for, for all of that, but that's really for the nerds among, among you. Um, and all these other systems that we're using are really meant through their openness to be sustainable, to be like uh, 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 perpetual. Yeah, so, so there's no hidden stuff that can suddenly disappear. These are like more or less standard technologies that are used all over the place and you just need to maintain them to ensure their survivability. Um, if you look at the kind of systems that, uh, that we have, the main uh, uh, elephant in the whole thing is of course uh, the systems on cypos.org. Uh, we have a number of systems associated to that to, uh, uh, to enable all the uh, uh, daily operations in there. Again, if you're interested in these things, you know, you can. Uh, uh, you can contact me and I'll tell you about it. We've got machines also for, uh, 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 you know, for, for external machines to, to query the data in there. So we're trying to provide also uh, some information to those metadata lovers uh, out there. I'm personally very, very keen on metadata. I believe that uh, having a proper metadata, metadata system really empowers a lot of developments for these things. So I'm really kind of looking a lot into that. Uh, so all the uh, technology behind SciPost is uh, made openly accessible on our uh, Git, uh, Git server at git.sipost.org. There you will actually find the actual code base that is running on SciPost.org. So you can actually look at, you know, uh, at what drives the website that you're looking at when you are um, visiting SciPost. There's some documentation associated to that that we still have to, you know, uh, build a bit more, but it gives you a bit of an idea. Uh, for developers, how it's built and where it's going. We also have a, a, a discourse server where some of the more public discussions take place about perhaps strategic decisions, some uh, some information we want to get from the community. These are all part, part of the constellation of uh, systems that uh, form SidePost as an initiative. Okay, um, so 
um, what are the main difficulties that we are facing? Of course, there are lots of day-to-day -day little difficulties and referees not answering emails and that sort of thing, but these are really, how could I say, normal, yeah, uh, ubiquitous in the industry. I think for new initiatives, there are two things that are of importance, especially for one like Sidepost that tries to implement a different business model. The first difficulty is really the question of recognition and reward, so the impact factor. So let me start with that. The impact factor I blame for being, without any doubt, the deadliest poison against innovation in publishing. There's no point mincing words on this, uh, this, uh, uh, this piece of information that is compiled in that particular way and run by these closed unverifiable systems essentially is a break, a total showstoppers for new initiatives. It will take you at the very minimum four and a half years in order to be included in the uh, uh, in the indices that you want. And that's if everything goes absolutely fine. And this to me is absolutely unacceptable because um, uh, quite frankly, and I've done that test, uh, uh, if I take the least qualified person to judge scientific quality at SciPost, and say our youngest, most inexperienced fellow, I can still vouchsafe that this person is more qualified to judge scientific quality and impact than the most qualified person at the company providing me with the impact factor. Yeah, there's a, there's a certain value in counting beans. However, the, the tragedy of the impact factor is in the breaking that it does, the, the kind of slowing down of possible developments. You have to run an operation blindly for a number of years before you actually can get your recognition. So the way I like to, uh, to express it to, uh, to scientists is that indeed, uh, 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 when, you know, when I started SciPost here, I was asking my colleagues to jump out of the airplane without a parachute, uh, without a parachute. Yes, indeed, their papers would not be listed, their papers would not be uh, uh, recognized for a bit. However, I would provide them with a parachute before they hit the ground, yeah, because there was a certain amount of uh, time uh, for this. But it would be a much better world if we just got rid of that thing and use perhaps a much more diverse set of metrics. It's not that I don't like the impact factor itself as a quantitative measure. I'm a scientist. I'm able to see the value of a reproducible uh, measure on things. The problem is that it's become so ubiquitous and that it's, you know, uh, it, it's breaking the new developments. So anyway, so that was a big problem. Second big problem, of course, is that, uh, uh, you know, this is kind of the stupidest business model that you can possibly think of. I can't exactly go with SciPost business model to the bank and ask for five or 10 million of funding in order to grow. All the growth in the initiative has to come from essentially, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, gratuitous work on the side by, by people to make it grow. And then once it's there, then you can expect maybe some sustainable funding. Um, uh, the problem also is that institutions worldwide are not used to dealing with other systems than the APC-based system or the, uh, uh, the, uh, the old subscription model. All the efforts that are currently coming from high above are in the end only facilitating these APC-based systems. Um, so leaving only crumbs for diamond initiative in the current landscape. And then uh, essentially there are lots of knowledgeable people out there who are already very sympathetic with, uh, uh, with Diamond and whatnot. So, so, so those will uh, give you some funding and that's great. But the, uh, the prospects for growth there are severely limited by current happenings in, uh, uh, in that. So you know, uh, we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit uh, later. Um, so uh, that said, yeah, uh, like I said, we, uh, uh, we have managed to obtain a large number of uh, funders for SIPO. So we've got about 90 institutions worldwide now that do provide us with a certain amount of uh, uh, funding for this. And I'm very pleased, for example, to uh, have recently welcomed the ICTP itself as one of our funders and with a, a good amount that uh, uh, actually almost exactly covered uh, all the expenditures that we made available on the site. So this was like a, a, a top mark <laughs> exercise from the, from the ICTP. We're very, very thankful to, uh, uh, for this. Okay, so um, uh, what are the lessons uh, that, uh, you know, the experience of SciPost gives uh, is that when you think about the reform of publishing, and at least when you're starting, you think, oh, you're just gonna, you're just gonna build the system. And within a couple of years, it's going to run at scale. I had given myself three years to really make this thing float and scale up by a couple of orders of magnitude. We're now six years down the line and I haven't reached the two orders of magnitude, just one order of magnitude. So it's too slow. 
Uh, more importantly, I think the current landscape is misdirected. And what I mean by this um, uh, is that the incumbents are being favored by the current, if you want, style of negotiations that are there. The kind of emphasis on uh, uh, transformative agreements is, I think, almost fatal to the diamond landscape. It's extremely pernicious uh, uh, what kind of effect this, it has on that. I really, I, I really think that this was the wrong way to go about it. There was an opportunity to force reform, but this was dilapidated by these perhaps watered down choices that were made from high above. It's very interesting because I've got many people, many friends working in business. And when I tell them about the developments in there, they say, you know, this, this world is completely crazy because it feels like it's not the client dictating the terms. It's not the client making the choices. It just doesn't work. It doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. So perhaps there's a kind of correlation there that people end up in academia by the lack of sufficient business savvy. Because what I observe of all the happenings of the last few years is that there has been a very dramatic uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, exploitation of the academic side by the other side. It did not need to be like this. And wouldn't it be nice if it changed? But yeah, I, I'm going to be happy when I see change, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, I think Tony also mentioned these really, really nasty things that are currently uh, happening as well. So like this uh, surveillance uh, 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 technology that's being installed in lots of these things. You'll have lots of denials from these things, but you know, I've uh, I've done quite a lot of things with uh, with hacking and information and whatnot, and what you see in there, I can tell you, it's not good. <laughs> so it's not going the right way. Um, carrying on with uh, with lessons, I mean, what I'd like to tell funders and institutions is that if you do want Diamond to scale up to its potential scale, you really, really need to uh, uh, consolidate the way you support it. You need to make, uh, to make sure that the funding is sustainable so that long-term development plans can be implemented. And please stop facilitating APCs. Stop saying that from a certain point onwards, your scientists will be able to publish for free in those and those and those journals because you have spent two years negotiating with them. We don't get such press releases at SciPost because institutions don't need to negotiate with us for two years. So one has to be extremely careful here uh, uh, to, to not kind of suffocate the potential of, uh, of diamond in there. So really kind of try to invest in diamond because I think the returns would be quite substantial. And when you do talk to the corporate representatives of these, uh, of these organizations, you do have to turn to tune up your bullshit filter because a lot of stuff that you read is factually demonstrably incorrect. However, uh, 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 kind of push through because of the additional ease or perhaps the correspondence with the habits that you already have uh, uh, all being in place for you to, to do that. So, you know, uh, just uh, uh, a bit more business savvy here, please. Uh, my, my final thought here to kind of summarize a little bit how I feel about all of this, um, it's that if you think about open access publishing, it's a bit like Linux. And uh, what do I mean by that? Well, quite frankly, uh, there's a reason why all the big mainframe servers out there run on Linux or the, those kinds of things. It's kind of a superior technology. It's a tweakable technology. It's a much more powerful technology than many uh, other competing things. Um, however, Linux is a completely balkanized, disorganized you know, community uh, uh, of people doing things in different ways uh, based on different tools. And it's competing against these huge corporations that have other reasons than, say, your computer's performance uh, uh, at heart. Um, there's a lot of customer lock-in in, uh, in these systems. It's a fragmented community. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to break through the adoption beyond the level of kind of uh, minority. Um, however, yeah, th that's what that's what I think here. You know, so so I was using Apple for my computers for many many years, and then I said, yeah, that's about. Uh, I'll throw this all out, and uh, indeed, I said, uh, you know, leaving all these uh, non-open systems is a bit like uh, leaving a, a multicolor candy superstore and setting out on the uh, in the Canadian wilderness. Yeah, so uh, yes, indeed, you know, in your canoe, you have to paddle a bit harder. Uh, you don't wash so often, and there are mosquitoes. However, the views are much nicer. Yeah, so it's uh, it's kind of a good thing to try to, uh, to try to go for. So um, that's it for the talk. I'll just open it up for questions. Uh, that's the team uh, behind SciPost. So you know, uh, good people like uh, Paula Perez, Sergio Tapiasate, Jan Willem Vijnen, Thijs uh, uh, and George Katikas, uh, who run really on a day-to-day -day thing. And I'm taking care of the uh, technological aspects of it and uh, a lot of the political things. Jos van Mamere, Jasper van Wezel are the other two members of the SciPost, SciPost Foundation itself. And with this, 
I will thank you for your attention and give the control back to the chair. Okay, super. So I, you know, thank you very much for the great talks. We do have some questions. So let's start with a question for Tony. And someone asked about uh, what do you mean by training? So it was one of the needs, right, that you pointed out in yeah. one of your last slides. Yeah. So um, open science, obviously, it needs a lot of support in terms of awareness raising of what it is, but then uh, also a lot of uh, training and support in terms of how to do it and what, what things mean and uh, uh, the best way to go about things. So um, access to resources for training for open science are not equally distributed. So within richer institutions, there are many, many uh, people who are in place to assist you in putting, um, for example, fair data policies into practice if you get a European grant. So I'm, as I said, I'm working with, uh, well, the project's on hiatus at the moment, but we were working with institutions in Ukraine and they just don't have the people in place that, that are already there in richer institutions to help you um, to take up these practices. Um, and my worry is that the more that we assume that um, this is the way that things should be done, this um, uh, discriminates against those who are from uh, institutions without those resources while they're there, but also once they move. So for example, um, I think uh, I, I saw a job posting um, for a psychology institute that said you would be judged on your commitment to open access for that um, uh, for that position. And if you haven't had the training and resources available to you at your current institution to be able to put this into practice, and it is the case that richer institutions are publishing more open access and consuming more open access as well, um, then there are just these effects of cumulative advantage that be mm. played in there. So uh, as a follow-up question, are there any best practices or, you know, some you know practices that people can look at you know to inspire their own you know training activities for example well yeah so um i think it's important that training materials are made open and not duplicated across institutions um so there have been projects in the past like uh, foster um from the european commission um, which has made um, a lot of training materials open and available to everyone. And obviously um, online training, which is available across the board is, is great. Okay, so on online material and online training. Okay, then I have a question for both that came in uh, through the chat. And they were asking about younger generations. So do you see a different attitude in younger generations, you know, towards open, open science? Tony, if you want to go first, and then I just I just spoke. So okay, okay, Jean Sebastian. Um, yeah, so um, actually a little anecdote here that I really like to uh, to recount. So when I first tried to uh, tried to attract people to use the Cypos systems, I was really aiming at the very well established professors in my field. You know, the kind mm -hmm. of big uh, big guns out there, because I thought, yeah, you, where these people go, others will follow. Uh, but of course, there, there are lots of uh, vested interests uh, in those people because they do feel that they need to get the next grant, not, not really for their own ego, but because of their sense of responsibility to their group. They are, after all, responsible for launching the careers of PhD students and postdocs and whatnot. So it's a completely legitimate position to be hesitant on that as you're a senior researcher. And then on the side, um, I, I kind of noticed that some junior researchers were starting to send their papers to SciPost as well, even before, you know, in the early days. And at some point, it was so systematic that I kind of ran a little informal survey and I asked those young people, hey, why are you sending your papers to SciPost? And they all gave me the same answer. They said, look, uh, uh, it's obvious the uh, uh, the older people, they're not the ones who are going to want to change the system. They're around for another five years or something. What do they care? I'm going to be in academia for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so take my paper. <laughs> so uh, and that was really, really quite, uh, uh, quite a motivator, actually. It was really, um, you know, uh, I'd like to think that we're not letting those people down who uh, kind of jumped with us. I, I, I'd like in the future to say, uh, to, to see some of those young people saying, hey, hey, look, you know, I was in the first issue. Yeah, you came in five years later. I was there at the <laughs> beginning. So I've got the kind of prophet's eye. Mm -hmm. 
not you, you're just a sheep. Uh, so, so that was very pleasant. Uh. Yeah, I agree. Like, so early career researchers are obviously more, I, I think we're all, or most of us are more idealistic when we're younger. And also with the older, with the older generations, there is a certain survivor bias. Like I made it in this system, therefore the system must be working well. Um, so I think there is, however, a big um, discrepancy between the attitudes of younger people and the actual practices that they use. And one of the main things there is that it's still the case that they're very often judged on their publications, just publications, not open science outputs. So if, if you're producing code um, or data, this isn't judged, but also not only the publications themselves, but also so um, the other speaker spoke about the impact factor. And I, I do think that perniciousness goes beyond um, like holding back innovation in publishing, but the way that the impact factor of journals is still used um, quite a lot in researcher assessment um, is a major disincentive. So I just saw on, um, on Twitter today, a major open science advocate, Thomas Suzy, has got himself in a bit of trouble because saying as an early career researcher, he still finds it in his career interest to publish in nature and science instead of, for example, Open Research Europe, a kind of open publishing platform of which he is actually an editorial board member. But he's right. He's right. Um, and so changing that um, is, is, and that's why the reform of rewards and recognition is, is really one of the key aims. And there's lots of moves underway um, from the European Commission and others to make that happen. Okay, super. Please, Atish, you want to join and ask your question? Uh. Yeah, first of all, yeah, I want to thank both of you for a very nice talks. Actually, it's very informative for me. I have a couple of uh, questions uh, just to understand uh, uh, regarding sci post. So when you say it's a diamond, so okay, do I understand that diamond means that it is uh, open for uh, its for both the user and the public, uh, author and the reader? No, that, that's that is diamond. Uh, yeah, so it's um, it's essentially about the way the, the finances are structured. So the kind of accessibility of the material uh, so that readers can access the uh, material for free and that authors can send in their material without payment, that we view as the kind of first thing we don't even need to talk about. I mean, any publisher not doing that is like, has got it wrong because uh, you don't want to have uh, uh, what I like to call lead pollution, which is a coupling between your editorial systems and the financial systems, yeah? because then you, you end up with uh, uh, the disaster created by APCs of these uh, predatory journals, which was like you know, so easily to, uh, foreseeable. So, so here really the, the kind of diamond term is coined because the funding model for it is really a kind of a, a consortial model, not based on transactions at the level of single publications. It's really, you're running a big infrastructure, people pour resources into it, and the system is run for everybody. Mm -hmm. I see, so, I, I want you yeah. to understand that, uh, I see like an institute like ICTP can, con I mean, so what I'm saying is that, uh, let's say universities in the developing countries if you have authors coming from them. So in order to make it a diamond system, you will need additional, because if the your current processing cost is 600 euros, you said, uh, your model is that this will come from a sense of community and consortium from within the community in the same way it has worked for the archives, for example. Is Absolutely. And it's kind of a funny calculation that you can make. It's one of these nonsensical at first sight calculations on business, which actually make a lot of sense. Uh, if you take first world institutions and look at their expenditures for publications, yeah, we promise them a reduction by a factor of five. And that gives us enough surplus to cover all the developing world and, and whatever comes, uh, uh, comes from there if we scale it up properly. That's the idea. So it is, it is just a reality that in terms of financial payments, there's no, there's no expectation that you know, developing world institutions will contribute the same as say the University of Amsterdam. And I will not hesitate to make that case to you know, Western universities and first world universities that they should contribute more because they're still saving money. 
So what's their problem? They're looking to save money. That's what we're empowering. No, so. no, I think that's fantastic. I'm, uh, I have to say I admire the idealism behind your uh, <laughs> thing, but it's also important that in the last six years, you have somehow managed to uh, not the reality intervene in a wrong way and uh, keep uh, your uh, goals uh, still in sight. So I think, uh, yeah, if there is any way I sit in an organization like ICTP can help, I would be more than. Uh, yeah. I, I should have. I, uh, th thanks a lot for your support. I mean, so community support like this is all we need, right? Because uh, then we hear what you want, we hear the way you would like to see this thing develop, and that's where we're going. Uh, but the ICTP, and I emphasize, just recently signed with SIPOS. So they did give us uh, 4,200 euros, uh, uh, which exactly covers the expenditures that we calculated for the services that we gave to the ICTP people. So it's like, you know, okay, perfect. But we give more, uh, no, but if, by, if your calculation is correct, we should give more, what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, because things are scaling up. Yeah, so and then, so so this covers, you see this, this payment that recently came from ICTP, we kind of, you know, uh, I should have shown you on the site, if you go to the organization's page, click on ICTP, you're going to see a tab with the financial calculation of our uh, estimation of the expenditures we've had associated to ITT ICTP against the payment from ICTP. Beautiful balance. Yeah, I think uh, it's like minus 83 euros uh, in there. It's like zero. It's perfect. But uh, but of course, this is about past things, you see. So, so, so then next year and the year after, things are going to be growing. Great uh, rate of growth, about 30%. So, you know, we'd like to be able to have this outlook on the on the things and that's what is not uh, installed mm -hmm. it, it, uh, an idea like side post is good if everything is stable but if you're trying to scale it up it's tough yes yeah. so actually i have a question regarding that if i may can i ask sorry marco do i have time a couple one more minute uh, first of all you said that you also act as a preprint server is this like in addition to what the archive does or is it something different or is it an overlay on top of it how do you it's uh, so it's it's not an overlay. Uh, so 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 we are not overlay journals or overlay preprint servers. It's like a it's a different thing. So we we connect to preprint servers out there, of which archive is the most important. But we connect to others as well. So you can you can deposit your paper in in other preprint servers, and then when you submit the site post, you just need to give the identifier ah, see, uh, of your paper, and then we our machines just go fish the information through the other machine. So it's really easy. Uh, but uh, the, the reason why we have our own uh, um, uh, submission system is because, uh, well, for two reasons, really. Um, there are some authors that need to do revisions on their papers, and they don't like to have like five, six archive versions. So they always kind of told us, can I give you the thing? No, no, no. So, so we said, okay, we need our own thing. So you can have submission streams that start with a, a preprint on uh, archive, but then the three resubmissions are on the site post preprint server. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that we also have a branch doing proceedings, uh, which uh, typically are like shorter papers. And uh, uh, people usually try to you know, go the fastest with this. So they don't bother with the archive. They go straight uh, to side post because they just want the end uh, proceedings published. But it's it's by no means trying to compete with archive or anything. Uh, it's just an additional oh, thing to additional. facilitate. Like, so can I ask you just one one question about, uh, uh, about I mean, I may have asked you this when you visited ICTP. So, uh, I mean, the, uh, what what is your lesson from this JHEP experience? Meaning JHEP was eventually taken over by Springer, right? So, what were the uh, what were the issues that forced them to do this, and how do you foresee avoiding it, and what can the scientific community do to make that happen? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, uh, so I was not a party to the internals of the happenings at uh, at JHEP. I think JHEP was really, really started by the community with exactly the right goals in mind because they wanted to have like community control of the uh, editorial processes and whatnot. But in a sense, maybe what proved fatal for them is that they were too early. They were like one step too early because um, they uh, uh, they adopted a financial model that slotted into indeed uh, subscriptions and then evolved into uh, 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 into what uh, what it is today, so I think uh, uh, there was uh, 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 there was a lot of personal involvement from some uh, some scientists in that, and that slowed down over the years. I think um, maybe the one big difference I would like to emphasize with SciPost is that the expertise to run the machines and to build the machines uh, it's also from the community. And I think that's the difference. 
uh, because uh, it would be very difficult to integrate SIPOST. And it would be actually very difficult for you know, a corporate entity to buy SIPOST and integrate their system. Of course, they could do it because they've got infinite resources. But I can, I, I can vouchsafe that the first thing that's going to happen there is that I'll tell everybody not to publish in SIPOST anymore, unless I'm dead, in which case somebody else is going to say it because I've been saying it all the time. Um, but uh, uh, there's absolutely no point in SIPOST if it does not preserve its community basis and consortial business model. It's just, and I tell that to the community, the day you come back from vacation and SIPOST starts charging APCs and, you know, is, is bought by this, you just stop using it. <laughs> Build another one. Uh, but there's somehow the cost, so you're, you, you're optimistic that the, the, your financial model you will be able to, I mean, if you, if the community supports it enough, then you are, is that the idea? Yes, okay. yes, yes. So the, the, the one thing that is uh, difficult to implement is a growth rate above 30% a year. That's tough. Uh, although it could, yeah, you, you have initiatives that mushroom by two orders of magnitude within a year. And uh, those are initiatives that uh, typically uh, go and get some, you know, uh, uh, some money from, you know, uh, investors that see a return in the end, and then they will get 20. You look at academia.edu, right? They got what, 22 million. I mean, come on. <laughs> I can't get, uh, I, I mean, any scientist in their right mind doesn't associate, you know, academic seriousness to academia.edu. It's just a total failure in that sense. So why do they get the money? Because it's a for-profit thing. And why doesn't SIPOS not get the money? Because it's a not-for-profit. <laughs> it's as simple as that. But it's it's something that we are condemned to. And there's just no point in SIPOS if it doesn't keep doing that. Yeah, it's like, no go. <laughs> okay. yeah. Super. Yeah, I have one more question, but I will let... Yeah, sure, go, go ahead. No, 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 let other people speak and then I will... Okay, there, 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 there's a few, few questions. So one is kind of a general one to, to both, I think, and it is about the rewarding system. So you both pointed out that that is kind of the crucial issue, right? So, um, yes, what could be done in practice, asks Nicoletta, on this side, in your opinion? So, Tony, if you want to go first. Yeah, so <clears throat> the reform of the way of the criteria that are used. So um, as part of another part of our merit, we uh, performed, a, a, so we looked at policies from institutions in seven different countries for just to see how much open practices as well as kind of responsible research practices were actually mentioned and open practices were, were hardly mentioned at all. We also looked and found that still the impact factor um, and kind of problematic elements of quantification, we've got to have this many publications per year and this kind of thing, um, still uh, dominated there as well. That needs to be reformed. But like I say, I think it, that reform is underway. So the European Commission at the moment is building this, what has been called a um, coalition of the willing. And there's kind of a groundswell of support for that. What that will look like in practice, I think, is, is an open question because different um, institutions in different countries st will, st will still have different needs. And a lot of that, um, this policy charge, is still led very prominently by Netherlands, UK, as a lot of open science policy has been. Um, and so whether that will definitely be in everybody's interest is open for question. I've got to get the door, so I'll uh, pass the chance to ask And uh, for me, just uh, expanding on uh, uh, on this thing, so I, I I envision a kind of divide and conquer strategy with metrification like this. So, uh, what is the real problem with the impact factor? And let me make let me make again my perhaps controversial statement. Inherently, objectively, there is nothing wrong with the impact factor as a metric. Yeah, what is it? It is a statistic. It is a thing that you can compute if you have the available data. In itself, that is not pernicious. Yeah? Uh, 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 however, what is bad about it is that it has become synonymous with quality evaluation, which it is not. <laughs> yeah? And it is used, I mean, the, the moment when the crime is committed is when people are ranked for one thing or another, be that internal promotion or grant, uh, grant giving, people are ranked and you know, inequalities develop 
between people based on that information. It's completely ridiculous. So here's a, so here's a strategy that I want to uh, to implement with a side project that was asked about uh, online. It's a project about metadata. Uh, I want a divide and conquer strategy. So uh, sure, I, I want the impact factor. I also want the impact factor normalized by the number of authors. I also want the impact factor normalized by the square root of the number of authors. I want a, a, a true uh, impact factor that starts counting citations two years after publication, not within two years, after two years, because that's impact. And I want to rename the current impact factor the splash factor, because that just creates immense commotion and you know lots of citations that might very well disappear. That is not impact. Uh, I, I want you know you want to define your own metric with citations, then you know let's <laughs> let's do it. So you, you have then this whole class of different metrics that you could have, and then you might have thirty different numbers there, and then you start asking your question uh, yourself the question you know are these numbers actually really telling me something about the paper? Wouldn't it be better to just go look at the paper <laughs> and kind of, kind of see? So just to train, change the habits, again, by empowering the community to do something else. Why is the impact factor used? Because people can just log onto the well-known site and click on a few buttons and get the number. That's it. Yeah, there's nothing more to it. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so that's, that's my vision for this. I would like this to, uh, uh, to change yeah, it that way. Super. We have two more questions in the Q&A forum here. So one is about participation from the Global South in the Diamond Open Access Initiative. So if you want to, to comment on that. Uh, yes, so superb question. I, I, I did not, uh, I, I'm very grateful for the chance to sing the praises of the Global South here. So if you look, for example, at what's happening in, uh, in Latin America, I mean, they, uh, they really, kick ass there. They do open access in a fantastic way. They've got wonderful infrastructure, lots of technical capabilities, lots of community spirit, well-established, scaled up, uh, scaled up system, financial support. It's really, it's got everything you might want. If you could transplant the model from Latin America into Europe like that, we wouldn't need to have these discussions. Yeah, it's infinitely better. So, uh, uh, so you know, they're a great inspiration. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, you know, collaboration with such people is like fantastic. Uh, that would be really, really, uh, really great. There are different weighings. There's lots of space for different types of journals. For example, SidePost really tries to build top down. So we try to really start with the excruciatingly high levels of quality that we can filter out small scale and then grow a bit uh, from the bottom. Most of the other open access initiatives, they do it kind of the other way around, right? You do the service for everybody and you try to scale it up from that. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, there would be, uh, there would be space for like, you know, not really competition, but cohabitation of all these systems in an international level. And in terms of just business model, one of the things which, I, uh, uh, which I'm working on, which isn't out yet, is also a recognition for the uh, person power that's put into the processes. Okay, we, we have an expenditure of about 600 on average per paper. But that doesn't pay for everything. It doesn't pay for the time of the referees, the fellows, uh, the people who you know uh, do this and take the votes on this. I would like that to be compiled. So then, yes, indeed, maybe the uh, uh, the, the North institutions, you know, they, they give they give money, their academics give time, and then the developing countries institutions they don't give much money. They can if they want to, but they don't have to. But they can give expertise. They can give time, and that's valuable. <laughs> So, so if you're able to kind of have a business model that also informs your visitors about what has been contributed in this in-kind way, yeah, you know, it's uh, that yeah, that would be great. And yeah, okay, it so would make them feel sure. more welcome to the thing mm -hmm. as well. Because one of the one of the one of the fears I have is that indeed they they kind of come, they say, okay, yeah, fine, sure, I can send my paper to Cypost and whatnot, but really, my institution is going to be asking, is there? You know, it's like a subtle barrier sometimes through mm -hmm. lack of comprehension of what the, the thing is. And certainly with the amount of publicity that transformative agreements and all these new celebratory, you know, champagne things about these new agreements, if you're coming from outside Europe, these things work like a complete no-go. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's just, it's so bad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. 
we have one more question for you about uh, Cypos. It's about the topics. So there was one question about papers of innovation and technology. Are they of interest? And what are the topics now? It's physics and political sciences, right? Yeah, so so we've got uh, so what happened with political science is that I was approached by a number of academics doing migration politics, and they said, you know, yeah, we like uh, we like the way you do things. Can we have a journal? And I said, fine, you can have a journal. Yeah, just like uh, I open up a journal journal in the database, but then they run uh, the the whole process. They form their editorial college. So there are uh, uh, there's one requirement to start a new field at Cypost. And that's to have a group of academics willing to form an editorial college. And you know, you want good people from throughout the world with a distribution between you know senior, less senior, but you know, really well established academics that are able to pull people in. So if if you know we were approached by a community willing to uh, to, to do this, I say, yeah, we know people and we're kind of keen to do this. Let's uh, let's just do it. We've made some attempts to do it in mathematics, but that was uh, it's very difficult because mathematicians are quite traditional uh, oriented in, in their things. So that really didn't take off. We're trying to make some efforts in chemistry. Chemistry is extremely difficult because they're very closely embedded with their professional societies for lots of reasons. So the competition space there is, uh, is very difficult. And innovation and technologies, I don't know, we'd have to look into it. But if there's a bunch of academics willing to do it, then yes, it's just a question of flicking a switch on the database and then you have it. <laughs> uh, OK, super. Um, Atish, I think you had a last question. Sorry, uh, no, I wanted to ask a question regarding, I mean, you talked about this uh, fetish of excellence, so, which I think uh, regarding merit now when I'm asking the question to no, I mean, and I think it's certainly that criticism is correct, especially if it is done with uh, emphasis on some mechanical metrics like uh, what uh, we were talking about. Uh, but at the same time, there is a notion of uh, excellence and quality uh, that is undeniable in scientific uh, publications and which must somehow be, I mean, Otherwise, you know, science doesn't really exist unless we have some kind of a, a good way of community validation about what constitutes correct proof or what constitutes. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I just wanted to know what you think about it, and also, I mean, in some ways, SciPost is an example which is going in that direction. Or uh, well, maybe you could comment on this. Uh the, there's an excellent paper, um, I don't know if you know it, called Excellence R Us by Cameron Elon and uh, Martin Eve and colleague. And it's just deconstructed, what, what are we talking about when we talk about excellence? And the notions that we have of excellence and quality, they, they sometimes kind of degrade into our hands into kind of that notion of you'll know it when you see it, you know? But who, who knows it and who sees it? So who is judging? Like who is on the panel deciding what is excellent? Because like principles of homophily, very often they will be choosing people who look and sound and, and talk like them, who have come from the same labs as they have through the same systems. And this is really about the essence of, of that. So um, maybe one, one really interesting thing at the moment is the rise in discussion of lottery systems for funding. So, <laughs> Um, people reviewing grant proposals, for instance, are very good at telling bad from good. But then the good from the excellent is sometimes they're not. And so there is a lot of discussion at, at the moment about maybe you introduce some sort of lottery um, system into this. Um, the clustering of resources at the excellent institutions, whenever that happens, it, it is this feedback loop because the resources will end up in the same places that we know, and we could pick them on the map, you know, and I'm sure in physics, you can pick them on the map as well. Um, this, is, this is all. If I may add a couple of things, I mean, uh, so, so indeed, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very uh, uh, close to what, you were, uh, to what you were saying, where, you know, uh, when you say that excellence, indeed, as a scientist, 
you get a feeling. I mean, for example, my my big uh, uh, my biggest uh, uh, you know totem is uh, Duncan Haldane. No, so Duncan Duncan Haldane is a very special researcher. It's like a different taste, and you don't need to tell me anything about his citation records or whatnot. I I know Duncan. I know his work. I know the significance of what he has achieved. The depth of it. That's not measured in metrics. In a sense, it's even anti-correlated because, yeah, some of his papers are not cited for years because nobody gets them. But then, yeah, 15 years later, finally, yeah, somebody does it. And then, indeed, you do see that there's, a, that there's something there. So you can't capture that in metrics. There, there, there must be space for, uh, uh, for all of these things. Um, so I think, indeed, what I really like about the modern discourse about it all is the kind of tendency to give pressure to people to go look at the paper. Yeah, go back to the source, because that encourages you to know really what the content is, whether it's really good, and then you can form yourself a good opinion. You don't need to like real, like real, write little numbers and whatnot. Um, uh, and then word of mouth, you show it to your students, your collaborators, it becomes significant in one way or another. That I like very, very much. There is one thing which I would like to warn absolutely everybody against, because I am totally against this. It is the Twitterization of uh, research, the Twitterization of essentially saying, oh, you know, we, uh, we've got this new preprint and we do this and that. Why? Because this completely obfuscates the thing. You end up valuing people who are good at creating networks and creating nice things. This is not what we want. Uh, uh, this is at least not what I want. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, I would, I would much rather sometimes that scientists were banned from discussing science on Twitter, that they could maybe agree to go have a discussion forum somewhere, but not on Twitter. Why? Because publishers use that to try to propagate things. You've got networks building up to try to create some structures that don't exist except in the strategic planning of the information managers of these, these things. This is all polluting science. You don't want that. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, SciPost wouldn't even be on Twitter. I wouldn't even be on Twitter if I, if I could choose it. I hate the place. I think it's ridiculous. But, you know, you, you, you have to do a little bit of, of things just so you have connections uh, to things. But a big word of warning here. This is not progressing in a way which is conducive to well-informed academia. It serves a communication protocol. But there's this layer of promotion in there that then starts being pernicious. So we'll see where it goes. But, uh... Okay, thanks. Actually, you know, I, I should tell you that I did publish my first paper in SciPost <laughs> recently. Uh, but I just wanted to ask you one last thing that do you think it makes sense to have something like lecture notes, meaning uh, like the Springer has these lecture notes? I mean, curated and editorialized uh, high quality summaries of uh, you know a, a whole field i think those i mean this yellow series of springer was very influential yeah. and we think cypost can think of yeah posing so, an alternative for that yeah we have a journal called cypost physics lecture notes uh -huh. and this is for like research level research notes mm -hmm. so for example we signed with the lesouche school so the Lesur School, their lecture notes are now published through the SciPost systems. And we've also just signed, just come to an agreement with uh, the Institut Physique Théorique of Saclay, of Paris, where they will also have their own series of lecture notes in SciPost physics lecture notes. So uh, yes, uh, so yeah. for lecture notes, this is already in place and it's a question of scaling it up. No, that's then a related uh, ICTP has you know very many high quality conferences and okay this could be something that could be of interest. You got to look into it and if you're interested we can talk because indeed that would be fantastic and also with the kind of projection of ICTP it would really help bring the world you know developing world into the systems as well and that would be extremely valuable that would be most welcome yeah so lecture notes sorted uh, one thing which we have not uh, uh, started, although I've wanted to do it for a long time, are um, reviews. Yeah, so so like uh, uh, do yeah, do. I'm in both actually. I'm in both. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So huh? lecture notes is sorted, but reviews are not yet sorted, and you know there's no reason why we don't do like big reviews. 
like reviews of modern physics or uh, or something. So 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 uh, if you can convince the rest of my team that uh, we we should do it, but the reason why they don't want is because they say I've got too much on my to do list uh, first, and they'll be happy to do it once I've done what I've promised uh, to do. <laughs> so it's my fault, really. <laughs> we have one last question. Um, can we develop a roadmap to cypostify the publication of an existing professional society? What would be the way, you know? So uh, how should I interpret the question? Would that be to republish the existing corpus or just to, from a certain time onwards, do it? Yes. Uh, so, right uh, so, uh, so this uh, uh, this is possible. There are, however, limitations because the the Cypost systems, yeah, they're they're uh, in house built, which means that the systems themselves intimately reflect the editorial processes that we have. So one would then have to accept to run through these processes with the open refereeing and the college based decision making, and if that is okay then it can be done uh, you know, uh, in, uh, 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 in a tiny moment, uh, because then the advantage of that is that you already have a, a college, factually. You've got an editorial board. You've got a knowledge of things. The one thing which is uh, uh, difficult with this is that the um, history of the journal is not automatically transferred onto the new system. So, uh, so if, you, if you flip a journal like this, typically it's a bit like starting from scratch again, as far as the impact factor <laughs> is concerned and whatnot. But um, uh, but that that is this. These are the two disadvantages. So, so you'd have to you'd have to run it the way Cypost runs its editorial processes, and you'd have to be willing to have to swim underwater <laughs> while the transition is being made. But uh, but yeah, indeed, this is um, this is entirely possible. Excellent. Eva, do you have any closing remarks? No, I think I'm, I've just looked at the chat. Okay, I think we answered everything, answered all questions. Also with the q and I think we got yes. everything. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you so much. It was great to have you here. It was very, very interesting. And uh, Good to yeah, participants. Maybe, yeah. Uh, maybe praise we'll, to the participants. Uh, very nice yeah, discussion. absolutely. And maybe we'll we'll have we will be able to have a seminar like this uh, at ICTP soon. So that will also be because we uh, we were just for the other participants we were discussing before that it would be nice to have some Italian coffee and discuss things. Uh, have some more time to discuss things. Uh, so I see from the participants that there is lots and lots of interest there. So yeah, we'll see uh, what, what is going to happen in the future. So, but for now, thank you for coming. Thank you to the participants for joining. Uh, it was great to have you all here. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very, uh, very nice. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you.